Hello everyone and welcome to part 2 of Machining Reblades. In today's video, I'm going to be going over heat treating and some of the processes that go with it. The blades still have tabs and a machining shell around them. It is much easier to move this shell and these tabs before hardening the blades. There are a few different ways you could remove this excess material. If you decide to remove the material after hardening the blades, you'll be mostly limited to grinding tools or tools that are harder than hardened steel. If you remove the material while the steel is still soft, you will be able to cut the material off much more easily. The tool I will be using to cut the material off is a metal cutting bandsaw with a fine toothed blade. Cutting off these shells can be a very time consuming process, so I always recommend the path of least resistance. When cutting, try and cut as little material as possible and try to only cut tabs, although this won't always be possible due to sharp corners. There are tabs that can just be snapped off, but you have less control of what comes off with the tab and risk breaking your blade. I'm always very careful when snapping off tabs and make sure to cut the tabs in sensitive areas because if you don't, then sometimes you end up snapping off parts of the blade. Sadly, this process of cutting off tabs and shells creates quite a bit of waste. The blades now have all been cut out and are almost ready for heat treat. The next step in the process is to grind off and clean up the remainder of the tabs still on the blades. Another important step is to clean up where the mill may not have been perfectly aligned. You can see between the two pictures what a good job and a poor job looks like. So now I'm going to grind off and clean up the rest of the tabs. Now that all the tabs are off, it is finally time to start the heat treat process. The first step in this process is to protect the blades from oxygen. For this I will use high temperature heat treat foil. It is now time for knife making origami with Frankenforge blades. For this process, you're going to need some 9x6 squares of high temperature stainless steel tool wrap. I start off by measuring a 9 inch by 6 inch rectangle of material. This is the perfect amount of material for my blade pouches. I then use a square to make sure that all of my lines are straight. I then mark my 6 inch line. When marking your line, try and mark as straight as possible so you have a better line to follow while cutting. Now it's time to cut the material. I use a large pair of tin snips, but a smaller pair of scissors would also work. Be very careful when handling the material because it can be quite sharp and lead to some serious cuts. Now that you have the material cut out into smaller sheets, it is time to start the folding process. You start by folding the material in half lengthwise. You then want to use some sort of heavy object to make a better crease. After your steel sheet has been folded in half, you're next going to start folding the edges. Fold it down one time over a sharp corner and flatten it again with that heavy object. Repeat that process again, making sure to have two folds instead of just one. This allows it to be a lot more airtight than if you just used one fold. 
You then repeat the folding process on the long side. Make sure to fold it over a sharp object so you get that crease line. For hammering it down, I use an old hammerhead, but you can use any object that you would like. Always remember to fold it two times, otherwise you will not get an airtight seal. Do not fold the last side yet. Now that your patch has been mostly folded, it is time to get a blade in there. Start by covering the blade in talc powder. Only use talc powder, don't use baby powder, or put a piece of paper in there as some other people say to do. The reason I say to not use baby powder or a piece of paper is because they burn up inside of the foil and end up um, creating oxygen or other gases that will burn your blades. The reason talc powder is used is because when hardening stainless steels, you end up heating the steels up to a very high temperature, which can weld the blade to the foil bag. So to prevent welding, you have to use a barrier in between the bag and the blade. Now that the blade is in the bag, you can see that there is still some air in there with it. I like to use two pieces of foam and an arbor press to push the rest of the air out around the blade and thus just leave an imprint of the blade. You can see that there is no air with the blade in there now. Now that all of this is done, it is finally time to seal the bag. You repeat the second step and fold over the back edge twice. Make sure to do it twice and to get a good seal on it. Otherwise, oxygen will get in and contaminate your blade. Now the blade is sealed and ready for heat treat. This concludes Origami for Knife Makers, hosted by Frankenforge Blades. I'm now going to repeat this process 10 more times for the rest of the blades. Enjoy the time lapse. Now all the blades are done and finally ready for heat treat. To heat treat S35VN, which is the steel I'm using for these blades, you do need a heat treat oven that'll go up to 2025 degrees and hold it there for quite a while. Now that the oven has heated up, it is finally time to put the blades in. I recommend wearing a pair of gloves because it is over 2000 degrees out of that little opening and I lost all of my knuckle hair filming this little clip. After you put the blades in, the kiln will cool off so you have to let it heat back up, and then once it's heated back up to the target temperature, let the blades soak for about 15 minutes before quenching them. With stainless steels like S35VN, you plate quench them instead of quenching them in oil. So you take the blade and put it between two aluminum plates, where you then press down the plates until the blade cools off to room temperature. The aluminum plates do heat up quite quickly while heat treating, so with any quantity in heat treating, you will have to cool the plates off in between heats. I am currently working on some aluminum water-cooled blocks that'll help with this process, but I have not yet finished them. Here's a time lapse of the last couple blades. I'm going to finish heat treating the rest of them off camera. Here are all the blades after heat treat. As you can see, all the pockets are nice and nasty, but you'll be able to see the inside of them pretty soon, and that'll be nice and clean. Now it's off to tempering, which will take a few hours at 400 degrees. I am not gonna film that because it is quite boring. 
The blades have now been tempered and are ready to move on to the next process. They were tempered at 400 degrees Fahrenheit for two hours. I start by cutting off the end of the packet near where the edge of the blade is. I then squeeze it to open up the packet to make it easier to access the blade. Be careful when pulling the blade out of the packet because the edges are still very sharp and you can very easily cut yourself. You can see how some of the blades have this wavy blue and bronze colors. This is some oxygen getting into the packet, although it is not nearly enough to cause any issues. Now that all the blades have been taken out of the foil, I figured I would show you what the inside of the foil looks like. As you can see, it is very clean with no coloring and no carbon buildup, and you can very clearly see the inside profile of the knife with even small details like bevel lines. You can see that the blades came out very clean and have little to no discoloration. Coloration is a side effect of oxygen being in the container and starting to eat away at the blades. I was finally ready to move on to the next step, when of course something had to break. This is my old micrometer, and as you can see, it is no longer displaying a reading. I changed the batteries and everything, but it seems to have just broken. I have no idea what ended up happening to it, but it is no longer functional. Because my digital micrometer died randomly on me, I ended up going for an analog one. I have never used an analog micrometer though, so I had to learn how to read it. It turns out it's a relatively simple process that is not nearly as complicated as I had feared. Once you get the basic hang of it, it's very simple to check the same measurement over and over again, which I do quite a bit. Um, you understand where the lines should be, and it's just as quick as a digital micrometer once you figure out where you need to be. Just to double check my measurements, I ended up checking a blade which I knew was the correct thickness, and it confirmed what I thought was correct. The next step is to finally start surface grinding, which I start off by just barely touching the edge of the blade, just to make sure I have the correct depth. Once I get initial contact, I end up going over the rest of the blade. Surface grinding is a very boring and monotonous step in this process, but it is also a critical step. Surface grinding allows for me to get my blades perfectly flat and parallel. It also allows for quite a bit of dimensional accuracy. All the blades that I ground during this process were within a couple ten thousandths of an inch. For reference, a ten thousandth of an inch is roughly a fortieth of the thickness of a sheet of paper. Now that the blades have been surface ground, they have a nice even and shiny finish. After I was done surface grinding, I went through and did a quick measurement of all the blades to make sure they were correct, and any of them that were oversized, I went and redid. The micrometer is reading that it is a couple ten thousandth of an inch oversized, which is well within spec for these blades. That is it for this video. In the next one, I'm going to go over the final few steps in the process and get these blades ready to ship out to the customers. Thank you everyone for watching, and if you enjoyed, please consider liking and subscribing.